Hello, everybody. I'm trusting you all hear the microphone. This is Julie. I'm so sorry about last week. Since then, I've updated GoToWebinar. I bought a new uh, Jetpack. Everything should be working now. Um, I got a confirmation from a couple people that you can hear me. So if there are any questions, though, please um, send them through the chat or the question box, and I will answer those as we go. I did load the hand, uh, handouts, which are the notes of the slides today, so you can download those out of your panel. Um, they should be in the same panel with the chat and question box. Um, this is a special webinar. I know he's been working on it. Sorry for the delay, but uh, he's very excited to share this with you today. We will also be showing some hands-on technique about midway through, and I'll talk you through that as I set up the camera to show you what, um, what he's doing while he's treating. And we'll also show the force table. So it'll be a good day here. So um, without further ado, I'm gonna turn this over to Dr. Cox, who loves all things chiropractic, Cox technique and research oriented. So enjoy this webinar. Thank you, Julie. Um, we're going to look at the history of manipulation, where we are today and where we're going from here. Um, we're going to look at the principles of flexion distraction, what's called Cox technique. Some people don't like the name on it. You call it whatever you want, but it's a, a distraction decompression form of spinal manipulation. Behind me, you'll see this slide. If you look back there, there are three shelves of textbooks, and those books are the history of parts one, two, and three. These are the historic books that mark the very foundation of distraction. Could I show you something? When we, um, when we talk about vagal nerve stimulation, for instance, this is not new, you know. Here's a book by Major Dijernet, who wrote this book back in 1943. And when you look at this book, what do you see here on page seven? Vegas technique. He points out what it did. Closing the cardiac orifice of the stomach, open the pyloric orifice. So do we use this technique for treating GERD? Do we, re do we help uh, Nexium, for example? by applying chiropractic principles of vagal stimulation. It opens the ampulla of water to drain the pancreas and the gallbladder. It contracts the gallbladder, produces peristalsis of the gall ducts, opens the ileocecal valve, and slows heart rate. So when we look at these texts, they, they are historic. Many of the things that I will share with you are from AT Still. And when you look here, you'll see that I have the history and philosophy of osteopathy. My good friend, Dr. Kurt Olding, he said, Jim, your book looks so old. Somehow he got me a new copy of AT Still's book, from which I have learned a great deal and taught at the International Consortium on Manual Therapy at the University of Arizona. Here is one of the early texts that you see. This is Emma. This is Emma um, Ashmore, a great osteopathic physician. Again, Kurt got me a new copy of this book. I so appreciate that. And uh, these are in spotlights. I shine them on that shelf. We present this to you as a very basis of the beginning of chiropractic and the basis of where we are today and on that shelf my colleague like textbooks about the future i even have this book i don't know how important that is to you it's done by uh, it's a signature to george o'neill who was president of neil ross college of chiropractic in fort wayne you'll note that it has bj signature on it uh, this book is historic and probably quite valuable. So we've studied osteopathic technique. Here is a book by Alan Stoddard, published in 1966, on a manual of osteopathic technique, upon which we incorporate 
into our chiropractic care. So we're going to look at, at where we go from this strong foundation of Cox technique. Those of you who are certified, and some of you are watching, you know that we learn a great deal from the didactics presented from these textbooks, and it's from there that we build. I would urge you to always apply a careful understanding between the patient in their goal setting of their expectation and what we can really give the patient. We want to use patient-led goal setting because if we don't and we don't get the clinical outcome that the patient accepted, they get pretty upset. So much so that here on June the 3rd, on my Fort Wayne paper, this gunman killed his surgeon and his surgeon's physician partner and shot at other people because he didn't get the clinical outcome that he expected. If they expect a 100% uh, percent outcome, chances are they're not gonna be happy, am I right? I don't have the paper here, but I hope you'll believe me. I have read papers where every year there are nine people shot in this country by disgruntled patients who did not get the clinical outcome that they expected. And when you think about it, if they think they should get 100% and they get 30%, somebody's gonna be unhappy. We're gonna talk about tensegrity. Tensegrity is a principle that opposes compression. It is a principle of a discontinuous set of compression elements that are opposed by a balanced, resistive, continuous tensile force. You and I call that distraction, flexion distraction. Tensegrity, therefore, is a system of isolated distraction of a compressed tissue. Does that sound like what we have taught you in didactics? Yes, it stretches the components, the cores, in our case, annular fibers of the disc when we apply distraction. At the International Consortium on uh, Manual Therapy at the University of Arizona recently, we saw that Dr. Langeman from Harvard uh, discussed about muscle tissue surrounded by connective tissue. The connective tissue by layers forms fascia. Within this fascia are the arteries, nerves, and veins that supply and carry away the biodegradation products of metabolism. She talks of stretching as having an affect equal to that of acupuncture. Now, I just offered that for your own consideration. But look at Park's paper. He talked about back in manual therapy about the biomechanical analysis of two-step distraction therapy of the low back. It says that a combination of global axial traction and local decompression are what affect the annulus fibrosis of the disc and lower what? Intradiscal pressure. Are those not principles that you and I have done with federally funded studies? Absolutely, you should be proud of that. Gould writes in Spine Journal 2020, that degenerated disc, now follow this please closely, exhibit greater reconstruction under low tension distraction than high tension distraction. It is clear that the intervertebral disc mechanical microenvironment depends on it to a greater extent on low tension traction then high tension traction. We will talk about that as we proceed, even demonstrating the difference of two and eight pounds of distracted force under ultrasound and clinical outcomes. Yes, you are hearing some new things here today. This paper was called what? Stable Mechanical Microenvironments Created by Low Tension Traction Device. Beneficial, I didn't write this, that's the name of the paper for the regeneration and repair of discal degeneration. Now that could serve as quite a stimulant to you and to me 
as manipulating physicians. Next paper is by Olivier. It's about the management of acute low back pain in emergency departments. Well, what they're pointing out here in this study in April, just a couple months ago, in British Medical Journal Open, that high medication prescriptions, small rates of referrals to other healthcare services are seen in emergency departments. Yes, you know that we have papers showing that 10, 11% of people are referred to physical therapists or chiropractors for the care of low back acute pain. And yet, what are the guidelines? The guidelines are that first line of care is manual medicine, physical medicine, not surgery, where so many of these people go. Next paper, done by Scow et al., came out in last month in the Journal of Orthopedic Sports Physical Therapy. There is a low certainty of evidence suggesting the best practice and uh, of non-surgical interventions are viable alternatives to surgery. That is suggesting that most of these people with herniated discs can be treated non-surgically. In fact, what percent of patients go to surgery? 1%, what percent of them really have to? Many of them go to surgery because they're looking for a quick heal. Here's one. There is uh, emerging evidence that questions the benefits of traditional surgery for people with lumbar disc herniation. Therefore, surgery should be closely observed if it's going to be used. Surgical decisions should be made prudently for each patient. In other words, in the absence of progressive neurological deficit, Conservative care is used in treating what? Almost all, less than one to 2% of low back and radicular patients. You and I are certainly interested in balance. This is not a balance lecture. However, it is a lecture about the sagittal orientation of a human spine. Spinal balance anteriorization, that is people who begin to flex forward, their head gets ahead, of the weight-bearing line. These people have lower cognitive sense. They are undergoing a decline in cognition. And this paper points out that spinal posture in older population is indicative of cognitive decline. Then Hunter talked about muscle energy technique. I'd like to share this with you, and you can look at the paper if you have greater interest, please but thoracic manual manipulation improves two things. And please note this, pain and disability in patients with shoulder impingement syndrome. How many of us treat rotator cuff tears? People go to surgery instead. What does thoracic manipulation have to offer to these people? Well, Fred Mitchell, an osteopath, wrote about muscle energy technique. That is, you and I apply this technique and we stimulate the muscle spindle. It will send a sensory neuron stimulation to the substantia gelatinosa. It will create a motor response going back to that muscle, stimulating the Golgi tendon apparatus with manipulation. will also stimulate the substantia, go back to the muscle tendon complex and cause what? Relaxation of the muscle. Very important when you and I are treating acute, even chronic pain, and we want to relieve muscle tension. What else can we do? Well, here's Gonzalo Granito writing in, um, in this paper, the Journal of Chemical Neuroanatomy, March of this year, about curcumin, how it affects the cortical hippocampal neuronal shaping, how it affects the thalamus, the anterior cortex, the insula, the, the, the geniculate areas of the brain, how it affects the, the, the pre-central gyrus of the brain to create cortical spinal tract stimulation and the production of endorphins. So we use curcumin because it reduces cognitive neuronal and astrocytic signs of aging. As we grow older, you're familiar with the term inflammation. Inflammation. As we get older, there is a buildup of what? 
cytokines, inflammatory interleukin-1, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, all of these that induce pain and then disability. And as you and I discussed today, doctor, we are going to talk as you and I apply this technique and some of you with me will carry this into your practice and introduce it to your colleagues. That there is a difference in the force to reduce pain versus reducing disability. Please keep that in mind. So we use curcumin. This is it, curcumin from turmeric root. It contains Bosvillia serrata, white willow bark, and other introduced factors from, from herbs that reduce inflammation. It also contains quercetin for fighting inflama inflammation. Cruz wrote a paper. How does this affect you and I in clinical practice? Well, this is but an example published in the Journal of Chiropractic Medicine by Ralph Cruz, Ram Gudavale, Dr. White, about managing spondyl, spondylolytic spondylolisthesis in L4, L5 with this technique. This patient went from a BAS pain of nine to zero in a matter of very few visits in four weeks time after 10 years of suffering. So when you apply this technique and you think about our past research of dropping intradiscal pressure, increasing foraminal area, creating afferentation to the somatosensory cortex of the brain via the thalamus. You can see that there are various factors that you and I can use in spinal manipulation to lower pain and eventually disability. Heidi Havick from New Zealand has a program uh, at the University of New Zealand that talks about the immediate increase of muscle strength after manipulation of the spine. Can you imagine a 65% increase of average people, the average person on the street, 16% increase in chiropractic students and 8% in elite athletes. And then that brings you to think about other papers that have shown that a single spinal manipulation will increase the strength of the multifidus muscle of the lumbar spine, which lasts for seven days. Another effect of spinal manipulation. So with these factors in mind, where does that take you and me today? Well, it brings us to one of the new factors in measuring the forces and the clinical outcomes of utilizing ultrasound measurements during Cox distraction manipulation. This paper, incidentally, will be presented by Ram Gudavali and Cruz, Brett White, Stacy Ryder uh, from uh, Kaiser University College of Chiropractic Medicine and the University of Florida. They will be presenting this. August 21 to 25 in Ottawa, Canada, at the North American Congress on Biomechanics. It's going to include papers like Tozawa. What is the validity of using ultrasound by you and me in documenting interspinous space openings during our technique? Well, this paper published in uh, December 2021. Uh, in the Medical English Physicians 2022, was a reliability of using ultrasound to measure the interspinous spaces. And this paper showed that the interrated reliability decreased throughout the study. However, the results showed that using ultrasound to measure the distance between lumbar segmental interspinous processes could be applied in clinical settings to evaluate lumbar segmental mobility. That's where you and I are now and we will be going in the future, my colleague. For example, 
Here are interspinous spaces at one, two, two, three, three, four. Let's take two, three here, for example. 0.8 centimeters of interspinous space prior to applying Cox distraction manipulation. We then apply the distraction, and this 0.8 centimeters increases to 1.17 centimeters. All of the interspinous spaces show that opening. Then, once you release Cox distraction, this one comes back to 0.96 centimeters, one minute post-distraction. However, the question then is one of the changes within the osseoligamentous canal, the size of the intervertebral foramen, the opening of the disc space. And then with this amount of opening, what is the force applied, which you and I will be doing shortly, and then what are the clinical outcomes from various forces applied to the spine? Do you follow me? Does that make sense to you? Good. And we carry that a little further. If we look at this, this is a ultrasound study. Here are the spinous processes. Watch the movement of the soft tissues during ultrasound and the movement of the interspinous spaces. This is done at Kaiser University College of Chiropractic Medicine, and we will be measuring the effects of various muscles in the erector spiny group, the iliocostalis, the longissimus, the iliocostalis muscles. What are the changes in these soft tissues under distraction manipulation? So then we measure the full length of the spine. If you go from L1 to L5 spinous in neutral, 13.24 centimeters. We then place that into extension, and you will notice, please, how the interspinous spaces close down to the length now being 9.75 centimeters. Okay. So at Kaiser, and what I would like to share with you today is what we are doing, the forces from the literature as known today, that you and I apply and what the clinical results are shown to be. Now, this is the uh, Cox instrument. This is the new P9 GE ultrasound. This is Dr. Ram Gudavalli, the principal investigator of this study. And this is uh, Ms. Ryder, who is a um, um, MRI and ultrasound trained expert from, at the University of Florida. Yeah, Southeastern South University. East, Southeastern University, who comes to Kaiser to do these studies. This is her actually applying the ultrasound to the interspinous spaces of the lumbar spine. And we did this study to 30 patients without back pain. The strict protocols of this are what Dr. Gudavalli will be presenting next month in Ottawa, Ontario. This is Dr. Brett White applying Cox distraction technique, and we are applying this at various forces of two, 12, and 25 pounds of distractive force to see the variance of interspinous space change, the tolerance of the patient, and ultimately clinical outcomes. These are the spinous processes from which we measure the interspinous spaces. Chia wrote in uh, Technological Healthcare last year that this study, which you're going to be reading so much more about, of mm -hmm. joint mobilization technique, is an appreciable performance of the developed functional monitoring of technique among neck pain subjects is a useful educational tool, not only for academia, but to teach mobilization skills to physicians, in our case, chiropractors. They talk about in using the Maitland grading, that the lower grades, now please follow me here as we get ready for hands on, that the lower grades of one and two force 
and the definition of these is there, what the various grades are. But low grades are used to reduce what? Pain and irritability. Please note that. As we look at this in other literature, that low grades, that is low force distraction, reduces pain. Higher grades, three and four, where we begin to move joints in physiological range of motion, not necessarily with cavitation, and many patients never cavitate anyway. But as we apply grades three and four, they are used to stretch the synovial capsule of the faucet and passive tissues, now follow me, which support and stabilize the joint to increase range of motion. Low force, reduce pain. Higher force, increase range of motion, we'll see shortly, also reducing disability. So I'm going to share with you, and we're gonna look at Boss Good shortly, about low force to reduce pain. When do we switch to higher force to reduce disability? Karimi wrote here in 2017 that segmental distraction therapy might play an important role to treat acute low back pain due to lumbar disc herniation. We have many papers, as which you and I have studied together in didactics, showing the reduction of disc herniation. I think about O'Neill in Spine Volume 19, discussing 10 cases of seeing disc reduction and various degrees of reduction of disc herniation, which in many times mean nothing at all, especially when you're looking at chemical inflammatory changes. Then we look at Sari, who wrote in Physiotherapy Theory Practice, that during distraction, individuals with acute lumbar disc herniation, there is a reduction in the size of the herniation, increased space within the spinal canal, widening of the neural foramen, the intervertebral foramen, and decreased thickness of the psoas muscle under what? Stretch. Remember, as the osteopath said, the technique that gains benefit in distraction manipulation is the fact that we stretch tissues. We increase disc space, drop intradiscal pressure, increase foramenal area, create afferentation and lower cytokine inflammation. Yes, tumor necrosis factor alpha interleukin-6 have been seen in other papers to actually reduce under spinal mobilization and manipulation. Now here's Chow, wrote in Musculoskeletal Science Practice, that horizontal distraction, which is what you and I do and we will be doing together, is evidently effective in increasing disc height of lower lumbar levels, particularly in the posterior disc where the thinning and the tearing of the annulus allows disc herniation. Further evidence of the affect of distraction of different modes, magnitudes, and duration on the change in disc height is required for proper control of the distraction force. In other words, how do you and I determine the force we are applying in newtons or pounds to a spine with Cox technique. The highlights of this paper were the mechanical effects of distraction on lumbar discs were evaluated with MRI. Horizontal distraction at 42 pounds of body weight was associated with an increased disc height in the lower lumbar spine. Isner Horabetti wrote it differently. He said that a distraction force of 10% of body weight gave better long-term outcomes than higher forces of 50% of body weight. And when this was done back in uh, the year of 2016, how far we have come since then. Because now we know, as we are going to discuss, lower distractive force reduces pain, higher distractive force reduces disability. That's what Isner Horabeti was telling us, that high force versus low force in acute disc herniation with sciatica. What is the best? 
and there in the two week follow up, the low 10% force better. And as we move from low force pain to high force disability reduction, we are going to measure those forces shortly. This paper came out um, uh, at the abstracts of the uh, ACC conference. A clinical note was that the forces delivered by a chiropractor, delivered by manual and automated. You know, we do automated, but we don't do it until what? Close to 50% relief of manual distraction force. But in 12 patients were tested, the peak axial load of manual distraction was 74 newtons. Under automated long Y axis, it was what? 136 newtons. So before we apply a higher force, we have what? We have relieved a large amount of pain before we move into well above into a higher force of distraction. The clinical note I would beg with you today, training is necessary to discern and to apply the proper forces during Cox, long Y axis, automated and manual distraction decompression. Many people I fear are saying that they do this technique they don't understand force application. They don't understand pain versus disability. And therefore, how can I put this? You may not only be limiting your clinical outcome, but you may also be creating iatrogenesis for the patient. Krakoyas writes, the manual therapy, spinal mobilization is preferable to physical therapy in order to reduce the pain intensity and disability in subjects with chronic low back pain and associated disc degeneration. Doctor, I offer that you and my clinic see these people all day, every day. In fact, it is the most common thing that we treat, is it not? Discal degeneration and its stenotic affects. And in older people, that's increasing every day. So that by the year 2025, 59% of all people over 65 will have spinal stenosis. Many of these people will not respond to a high velocity, variable amplitude thrust, but they will respond to low velocity, variable amplitude manipulation, namely our technique. Gudavali wrote about treating post-surgical continued backs. Imagine this alone. This was a published paper in the Journal of Chiropractic Medicine in 2016. 15 DCs treating 81 people post-surgical backs. Imagine this. This is published for you. Without research, we don't have the foundation to move on. But greater than 50% pain relief with our technique was seen in 81% of post-surgical patients. That is people who had back surgery, still continue to have pain. And it was a mean of 11 visits over a 49 day period of care. Now I tell you, you and I see people every day who have had back surgery, they're hobbling around, they still have pain. And it's only after that, that 85%, after they've done everything else, they come to you and to me for care. Then this paper is a combination of non-surgical spinal decompression therapy with routine physical therapy is more effective than just routine physical therapy. Most of the people you and I see have already been to physical therapists. They've exhausted their routines and then they finally see a specialist in spinal manipulation. Now I'd like to lead you to the hands-on portion. I'd like you to note that bladder meridians lie on each side of the spine between the spinous and the transverse processes. They are all bladder meridians. And why is that important to be bladder meridians to control back and radicular pain? Because down here, when we look at these points of 32, 33, 34, even 35, which is in on this, which is Logan basic technique, 
These are pudendal plexus. These are the bladder veins that control urination, that control the sexual response of man, that control anal sphincter and sphincter urethroid membranaceae function. So then stimulating bladder meridians, this is the first thing that we do to stimulate them. And I've been working with this instrument, which I'll show you, to run up and down the spine to stimulate acupuncture bladder meridians. Now, if you think this is not old technique, this is Abrams' technique. I have Abrams' book in which he would put this over the bladder meridians and stimulate it all the way down. Now, I admit that's kind of crude, but he was thinking. He was far ahead of his time, probably. This is Abrams called it spondylotherapy. Aren't you great to get to see this today? I'm great to own these instruments of stimulating the bladder meridians. They create relaxation, relieve pain. And this is an instrument that I'm just testing out about stimulating these bladder points. So we stimulate bladder meridians, as we will show you. We look at the multifides muscle. Here we look at the love at reverse scoliosis. I even have the lateral curvature of the spine by love it. This is a love it reverse curve. Normally, when you lean into the low side, into the concave side, the spinuses rotate into the concavity of the curve. Well, you see here they don't. They rotate into the convexity of the curve. This means you have great multifides, rotatories, tightness. This is where we will stimulate and stretch multifides muscles very carefully so as to allow us to regain normal physiological range of motion. Here we look at the muscles of the spine. Here are the bladder meridians that we stimulate. Here is the longissimus thoracicus, the spinalis thoracicus. Here, the iliocostalis lumborum. Incidentally, all of you who use Cox technique note that occasionally patients complain of tightness, of pain, an ache in the thoracic spine. These muscles attach into the ribs and the intercostal area when we begin to distract and you, you stimulate some of these inflamed intercostal nerves, some of the acupressure points. If you just stop and just deeply goad trigger points, that will go away. You've all of you seen that. No one uses this technique without running into intercostal pain due to stretching of these muscles. Finally, Duarte wrote this paper that just came out in JMPT. The short-term changes in plasma cytokines in healthy young adults found that select plasma pro-inflammatory, that means interleukin-6, interleukin-1, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and dual role cytokines were elevated by higher compared to lower spinal manipulative treatment forces. I'll let that soak in. Higher forces actually increase cytokine levels. Low forces dropped cytokine levels. That's why you and I, as we will show on the instrument, we can lay down, begin to lower pain because they lower cytokine inflammation. Then this paper, so powerful by Masud, just came out in this journal, March of this year, the use of variable force lumbar distraction improved pain in degenerative low back pain, while high force lumbar distraction reduced functional disability. So my colleague, when we apply these techniques, we will see that the low force reduces pain. As that pain begins to dissipate, you and I increase the force from say two to four to six to eight pounds per triple joint complex by spinous contact in order to regain physiological range of motion, which we have discussed, and to not only reduce pain, but to begin to introduce a, a lowering of disability and increasing range of motion 
the ability to produce normal activities of daily living. Are we together on that? An example, before we go to the instrument, patient with low back and thigh pain following depression, decompression laminectomy. This man said back surgery. He, um, he starts out with three pounds of distraction from L2 and rendered 20% relief at the first visit, measured by a VAS and Oswester. Then we shifted to protocol two, using tetanizing current. We put him on. Pernicatoliculus, discat enhanced, 2000 in the morning, 2000 in the afternoon. We put them on turmeric with devil's call, white willow bark, and boswellia serrata, or frankincense, as you better know it. Formula one with B vitamins to convert homocysteine into methionine. We start with gluteal strengthening because of the weakness of the gluteus, which is present in 60% of these chronic low back pain patients and meta exercises to correct this scoliosis. So here's that patient, dextral rotatory scoliosis, decompression laminectomy at L4, degenerative disc disease at five, retrolisthesis of L5. And this patient, this patient who had already been to another chiropractor who did a um, high velocity, and then went to the emergency room, still thought enough of what chiropractic could do for him that he sought our, our office for care. People want, they know, if they're knowledgeable and educated, what you and I can do. In treating this case, to me, we have a good form of spinal manipulation to create all of the destenotic needs of this patient. So we are, therefore, on a trip. And the success of spinal manipulation is a journey. It is not a destination. I guarantee you, I'm in it for the journey and the long pull. Let's go to the instrument for treatment. My assumption is that all of you are trained in this work. You understand tolerance testing. So I know this patient, I'm going to move into care. So I'd like to talk to you about variance of force. I'd like to show you, say we're treating an L5-S1 disc herniation or spinal stenosis or post-surgical back. Here would be the application of various forces that we will measure with the computerized force plates on the instrument, realizing that force magnitude is very big in the study of the application of spinal manipulation, and you have been involved from the beginning of it. So I'm going to test this patient's tolerance just carefully, and I can see that my instrument is pretty well set. I make it so that I can run it with one finger, so my concentration is all on the interspinous space and the application of my force. So I'm going to ask you to note that if I come in contact the L5 spinous process with my thenar, I want you to notice what two pounds of force is. This is where I begin in treating acute, subacute, or chronic pain. I don't create iatrogenesis. And have you ever noticed how much benefit your patient says they receive from a very low force technique. Oh yeah, they say, that feels good, doctor. Do it more. Well, don't do it more. Because if you move ahead from increasing two to six or eight pounds, iatrogenesis may raise his head. So if you look at the instrument here, and I'm going to bring him to the taut point. And you see, my blue line raised to a taut point. I'm right there at 22 pounds of total force, but watch what two pounds of distraction is. My contact hand, my caudal section hand move in unison. And you'll note that that's two pounds of distraction force. You can see it measured. Did you feel that, Rick? Uh-huh. He cavitated 
Doctor, he cavitated, and this is a big man. He cavitated at two pounds of distraction at L5S1. You know when that happens, it's almost done. They are going to have tremendous relief. But I want you to see what two pounds is. Two pounds. Two pounds relieves what? By the work of Masood, Kirkadius, and others, even say myself. The two pounds will relieve pain. It's a very gentle technique. I'm going to lock the instrument and tell you that we treat these trigger points. And uh, I just like to share with you some historic events from the library. I don't know if you like this kind of thing, but I find this pretty exciting. I think about Abrams and his practice. And he's putting this thing on. He's stimulating what? Bladder meridians. I don't know that he didn't call them bladder meridians, but Major de Jeanette did. And I'm stimulating bladder meridians. Since you and I don't have, and I've used this on patients, I tell you, it works. <laughs> but if you don't use that, you can use the T. Stimulate bladder meridians with a T. Some of you who do acupuncture can even put acupuncture points in these. And remember, L2 is B22. So bladder meridian B22 all the way down to the coccyx, which is B35. And then, B32, 33, and 34 are pudendal nerves. Stimulate these with tushing, acupuncture, electrical current, or a T. And as we treat, this new instrument I'm looking at is a way to stimulate these bladder meridians. So with that stimulation, again, I'd like to share with you two pounds. Now I realize that what you're seeing, you're saying, Jim, that's really a light force. Oh yes. And yet I got movement, I got cavitation, I'm relieving pain, and I will stay there until I get 30-50% relief of pain. And again, please note, this hand on L5 spinous process, I move to the taut point, and you can see the blue line elevate. This is the taut point. This is the sweet spot. This is the point from which distraction force is applied. I've taken all of the slack out of every tissue from the ankle to the hip to L5. And here's what two pounds looks like. See, it's at 22 now. That's two pounds. Now the question in your mind is, can I limit my force to two pounds? Well, if they're acute backs, if you want to have a real bad day, you take an acute back and put eight pounds of distraction on it. They may not get off of the instrument. At least that's happened to me. But I limit it. Now let's say I move to L4, all right, taut point. Now when I move up the spine, you'll see I may exceed that two pounds to three pounds. Why? Because now I'm distracting two functional spinal units. And as I move up to three, and at L3, you and I know the femoral nerve radiculopathy, L234 nerve root compression. We're going to go down a little bit more than just two of them. For example, here, I'm going five pounds of distraction force. And that's where we will limit until this patient's pain is substantially improved, 30 to 50 percent. At 30 to 50 percent relief of pain, then you and I begin to think about restoring physiological range of motion,
increasing that range of motion and decreasing disability. For example, please, L5. I get this good relief of pain. I come to the taut point. Are you watching the measure? I'm at 23 pounds. I'm going to go to 4 pounds. And you'll see the increase in the curve. Can they see that, Julie? Okay. It's a little delayed, but yes, it's. it's well, there. anyway, you can mm -hmm. see the application of about four to five pounds of distraction. Now, if I go up to eight pounds, which is the maximum that I would ever suggest that you use, and you don't need to do that, but here it would be. eight pounds of force. Now Rick will tell you, he can certainly tell the difference between these various forces. But you and I are going to stay at the low force until we attain what? Pain relief of 30 to 50 percent. Then we can increase to protocol two, meaning that we will institute distraction and lateral flexion distraction and lateral flexion, circumduction, the strongest move we can apply, flexion, lateral flexion, and distraction in a smooth rhythmical coupled pattern. My goal has been to impress you with lowering your force until pain relief, then increasing four, six, eight pounds as you apply protocol two. Is that, is that clear? Are there any questions? None yet, but they can type them in if you want into the question panel. Now, please note, you and I do a lot of unattended or automated distraction. Patient comes in with no radiculopathy. They have spinal stenosis, degenerative disc disease, narrow disc spaces, Foraminal stenosis, no severe progressive neurological deficit. In these people with low back pain rating into the buttock, into the retrochocanteric space here, maybe even down the sciatic nerve to the knee but not below, these people can be treated beginning manually and once the manual treatment is painless, we can begin with automated distraction. But watch the force that happens. There's my force manual. I'm applying about five pounds of distraction here. But look at this when I go to long y-axis automated. Just hold. You can see that this is much, much more force applied. In fact, I'm going up here almost to 15 to 20 pounds. Once a patient is asymptomatic and I want to begin reducing disability, I carefully tolerance test my patient and say, are you okay with this? As I apply long y-axis attended distraction. Okay. Then, please follow. As my patient responds to care, I will lock this instrument at a flexion angle that gives them relief. I'll turn the instrument to automated distraction. I will set the force on the table to limit it to the whole spine at 25 pounds of distraction. I will turn the instrument on, set the, the pounds, and automated and allow the instrument to apply sectional distraction. I can even bring I can even bring the the uh, thoracic restraint over. If I want to isolate the distractive force to, say, T10 down to L5, 
I can apply the distraction with the thoracic in place. Okay. And then during distraction, in order to add the detente, and I've carefully tolerance tested my patient, I've taken them through manual two to six to eight pounds. I've tested them for long y-axis distraction, no progressive deficit. They've had 30 to 50 percent relief of pain. And I can take the instrument and while distracting, set a detente so that the instrument will hold for one to two seconds under distraction in order to enhance hysteresis. That is, as Beati talked about, there must always be, for a successful manipulation, imbibition of fluid from the cancer's vertebral bone through the end plate into the disc. So to enhance hysteresis, I will place them at detente, two seconds, observe please, it holds under distraction and comes back to neutral. You can even palpate the interspinous spaces and feel what you and I see on ultrasound. So ultimately we will measure the force. We will utilize AI to determine the disk space height, the pyramidal area increase, and then determine by condition like stenosis how many pounds will develop what clinical relief. Does two pounds give patients 50% relief or does it take 30 pounds? Okay, That's the future of this. I can also with protocol 2, while he's distracting, I can apply physiological range of motion under distraction. And if we look at our post-surgical back that we looked at with a laminectomy at L4 and right scoliosis, I can laterally flex into the side of that curve and into the convexity of the curve to the left in order to help to bring back range of motion and bring back physiological motion and positive pain relief to that degenerative scoliosis. I hope that's coming through. The goal of today is to talk to you about force measurements. It is the future of this work, and frankly, I think in all forms of spinal manipulation. Bring a magnum pump. I'm going to stop this. I'm going to lock the lateral flexion labor. I'm going to take off my thoracic restraint. I'm going to point out to you that this patient in treating because of degenerative disc disease, because of the research that you have from the notes today, will be taking pernicatoliculus, the highest source of chondroitine sulfate and glucosamine sulfate to give glycosaminoglycan increased synthesis within the disc. They will be taking Tumeric root for the chemical inflammation to lower the tumor necrosis factor alpha. They will be taking Formula 1 high B vitamins B6, 9, 11, and 12 to convert homocysteine into methionine. Then, I'd like you to follow me carefully. The frame of magnum pump means that you place the basi occiput in your thenar index contact here. Release the long y-axis lever. You okay, right? Uh -huh. I'm going to make my hand and the tiller bar move in parallel. Now, I'm going to ask the patient, does this cause you any discomfort anywhere in your spine? No. If a patient has stenosis, oftentimes when you and I stretch the dural sleeves, the patient will feel low back pain. They'll tell you, it's here, doc. It may even radiate into 
the retrochocanteri bursa, the going, gemelliopterid or internus complex. In many people, like that post-surgical back, people with balance issues, we will use frame of magno pump as a treatment because we are applying a distraction force. I'm going to measure it here. I come to the taut point and then Julie, I think you have to kick that into place oh, again. You went over 10 minutes. Yeah, I just wanted to measure the force with you. I'll frame a magnum pump. Because I'm applying a full spine distraction force. There's the top point. Now, here's distraction. You see, I'm applying on a full spine distraction from the frame of magnum pump. I'm going from 8... to 13. That's the amount of force I'm adding to this spine. And you can see it's a rather mild curve on the sine wave. I can add more force. And there you see increase to about 11 pounds of distraction. For many patients with cervical genic headache, dizziness, there was another cavitation. As you distract, patients will feel relief and pain in the spine, and oft times in frame magnum pump will give relief even in post-surgical backs because of the distraction we're applying to the lumbar spine, even though it is low. Please note here, I can contact the frame magnum pump with this hand, sacrum with this hand. And if I measure my force, I'm applying full spine here, about 14 pounds of distraction. Not near as much as you might think, right? And yet, for people who have tandem stenosis, both cervical and lumbar, they have degenerative disc disease and stenosis both in the cervical and lumbar spine and even the thoracic spine, I can apply full spine distraction. I can just hold the base of the occiput and apply full spine distraction. So in the neck, when we start with distracting, say, a disc at C5, C6, note I grasp the spinous process of C5. This hand, I bring this to the top point, and there I'm at. 13 pounds and here here would be two pounds of distraction force which is what I suggest you start with in a cervical spine two pounds of force now those of you who don't have a, a computerized force table you can learn this at didactics all of our instructors will take you to the instrument and you will do this until it's buried within your cortex that feel. In a neck with acute disc, we stay with this technique till 50% relief of the radicular component. Then we will move into protocol two, which is physiological range of motion with distraction and upper thoracic sympathetic reduction of pain. So, the goal of my discussion with you today, therefore, has been to learn low force for pain. As the pain dissipates, we move into a higher force to reduce disability. I hope that, I hope that this has been a strong message for you. I would ask if you have questions. I know that for many of you this is a new concept and it's born because of research like Mazud and the other authors that I've shared with you which are in your notes today. You'll find that if you use low force Cox distraction manipulation you'll get the results without the iatrogenesis. 
other questions? Yes, I have a question. I just Good. switched it over to your slide there for now, but uh, let's see. Is it still taught that we don't start protocol two until pain is no longer <clears throat> below the knee? Also, what about patients with HNP with no back pain, but only leg pain? Okay, I, I understand the question. Um, when you have people with no back pain and leg pain, we're talking here about non-contained discs, which are primarily chemical inflammatory changes. In that case, I don't have a but in that corner are, are galvanic units. And we put galvanism into that disc. Honey, you can see them on the shelf. They're over there. <laughs> and until we get that 30 to 50 percent relief of leg pain or it centralizes above the knee. And so we'll use a lot of galvanism in cytokine chemical inflammatory changes, which are primarily with non-contained free fragments of disc. Now you know that oftentimes post-MRIs will still show the same or even a bigger disc herniation. So our success is not from a compression probably, but from lowering cytokine levels. And you may have seen that now there is a urine test that you can do to measure the chemical cytokine tumor necrosis factor alpha to see what it was at the beginning and how it lowers with your manipulative care. So the second part, the first part of your question was uh, whether or not we still say that we want 50% relief of leg pain. Yes, we look for that 50% relief of leg pain because that's pain. That's what we're treating until we get that 30 to 50% relief at which we shift to protocol two and with very careful tolerance testing, we will begin to distract the spine to reduce stenosis, then place joints to their physiological range of motion. So as the increased range of motion, create affrontation to the brain and the thalamus and the somatosensory cortex. So I think I answered that question. I think you did. Pretty good. I hope. I think you did. Any well, other questions? That's the only one I have, but I think your slide here that you had, success is a journey, not a destination. I think that's truly part of what you did today. And yeah. He's been excited that, that you, to share the journey he's taken all these years and tried to sum it up today, and I'm hoping that that came across clearly, and I think it did. I think that it's important to note that so many patients want heavy technique. I've been reminded many times as a clinician that easy technique is best. I can remember a lady who came in to me and I was going to Hawaii to give a talk. And I gave her a very light treatment. When I got back she said, Doctor, that was a wonderful treatment. I then gave her a heavier treatment and she said, that caused me discomfort. All those things trigger your mind, don't they? They make it that it is a journey, not a destination. I'm sure you and I and some of you will be teaching me shortly about improvements of this technique. Thanks for being with us this afternoon. I, I think you see his passion there. Please keep in touch with us, um, coxtechnique.com for everything, Cox Table, Cox Technique Complete, CTRC. Um, we've got that free YouTube channel, a lot of videos there, Instagram I'm trying to keep up on. If there's anything that I'm missing, let me know. I appreciate all of you. I know most of all of you on here. Um, let me know how it goes. Sorry for, again, the microphone issues, but we've got them resolved. Enjoy your afternoon in practice. Um, as I know, Dr. Cox is excited and he's going to continue treating Rick and Rick's going to love that. Go enjoy your afternoon. Use that light force. You'll be amazed at, at how effective that is. So thanks for joining us today.